This is lecture material to continue physics 204 at John Jay College, City University of New York, Department of Sciences, um, summer semester 2020. This is to continue lecture material from last Wednesday um, regarding electrostatic fields. Um, and it's also meant to, to connect us and help us with the last two labs coming up this Monday and Tuesday, um, we, uh, which investigate electrical circuits. I still owe you all um, homework back and exams back. You'll get that. Um, your obligation to me at this moment is just to watch these makeup lectures um, and and uh, and and uh, accept my appreciation for your patience in the meantime. Okay, so this is back to this. Okay, nice. Right, it all begins with that, right? That's the electrostatic force between two objects, Q1 and Q2. It's the electrostatic force imposed by Q1 or exerted by Q1 onto Q2 and or due to Newton's third law, due to the commutativity of multiplication, it is also the force exerted by Q2 onto Q1. If the whole thing is negative, it's an attractive force. If the whole thing is positive, it's a repulsive force. Okay, that's the electrostatic interaction between two things that we call point charges, right? But what we're talking about here in class, and there's a similar equation to that for the gravitational attraction between two point masses. But what we're saying in class now, we're going to define the electrostatic field to be the net electrostatic force exerted due to some source, right, in other words, per Like, you don't even have to put that to, that's optional. Like, what field is, is electrostatic force per charge? And the per that we're dividing out is the recipient charge, the charge that would have experienced the force, not the charge that would have exerted the force, right? And that's why, in fact, we call the recipient charge this thing the test charge. When you're talking about electrostatic field, When you're talking about Do you want to see how it's written? All right, okay. Um, Force is something that one object does to another object. Field is something that one object does. To what? To space, right? Not to another object. To the field is all the information of the force, all the information that there could possibly be to constitute that force prior to or minus the information regarding that, then that on which the force will be exerted. And that's why we call that second charge or that receiving charge a test charge because it isn't there as such when you describe the field. Field is measured in newtons per coulomb, and it means how many newtons of force would be exerted on each potential possible uh, coulomb of positive charge that could be sitting there being tested out receiving this force. But the point is the field is there whether or not those test, those receiving charges are there. So we call them test charge. They like test the hypothesis of the field. Okay, so this is what the field is. And it, there's a similar one for gravity. Um, but for a point charge, for a point source, I should say, this means
for the field due to a point source, uh, the equation, the function, uh, uh, looks like this. Now, in other words, there's a Q in this function. There's no second Q in it because it's the field due to some point source Q. There is an R in it. It's a function of R. A field is always a function. A field is a rule that says, given some source distribution of charge, you go out any displacement, you name some R from that source, and I'll tell you how many newtons per coulomb are waiting to be exerted at that R that you pick. R is always a dependent variable. And, and like E is the dependent variable, the row vectors. R is measured in meters. Um, and E is measured in newtons per coulomb. Um, for a point charge, if you want to know the magnitude and direction of the field at any point, it's this, okay? Just like for a point mass, just like for a point mass, the gravitational field would be this. Okay, that's the magnitude and the direction. That's that means you pick a point mass. You know, uh, you pick some point in space and say there's mass there of a certain amount of kilograms. Well then, if you plug those kilograms into this, I can name any spot, okay, three miles from that point uh, over in here in this direction. And you'll tell me, aha, if you were to stand there for every kilogram that you put there, it'll be pulled toward this point source with so many Newtons of force pointing in this direction, right? Like that's what gravitational field says. Okay, but that's for, a, if the sort for a point source, I should say, these equations, the inverse R squared, assume that the source of the interaction is a point. Uh, point source. I, I missed this for the longest time. It's really important. Remember, we did this crazy problem with gravity in the first exam. Remember, Remember, once you have anything more complicated than a point, then what you have is a collection of points and all their for the forces that each one of them exerts superpose, obey superposition. And so then the end up the force function that you get once you have more than one point is not necessarily at all just an inverse R squared function. We found that if you collected all those points into a shell of mass and looked at any point inside that shell, you'd get zero for the net gravitational force. We found, we recall, for a solid sphere of mass, right, of given mass, capital M, and with uniform density. We assumed if we had a Sphere, a solid sphere, plum pudding, of uniformly dense mass, such as this, we found, we found that the net gravitational force exerted on any one little particle of mass anywhere within that plum pudding, we found very important. This is like very important. Remember, we found that once you start collecting points of mass into any kind of shape, you're lucky if you can get any result at all. In principle, you have to integrate the result from each point. But if you can take, sometimes you can take advantage of symmetry and symmetric situations. So we found that for a solid sphere of mass, the net gravitational force exerted on any one little particle M2 at some variable displacement from center, lowercase r, we found that the gravitational force did not obey an inverse R squared relation, but was directly proportional to R, right? We found there was like a, a, a constant R cubed in the denominator, but then an R itself in the numerator as a, 
opposed to being squared in the denominator. Okay, what did that mean? What does that have to do with electricity? Well, first of all, that meant if First of all, if that's true, then what we were really saying was that the gravitational field at any point within a solid sphere, at any point variable r from the center, what we're saying is that the gravitational field was this. Right? In fact, we totally used that to realize that there was a differential equation that we recognized and we were able to solve it and do harmonic oscillation. But the important thing is that the field, the field, the force per unit mass um, is not always R squared inverse function, that it is for a point. But once you're dealing with more than a point, you have to take advantage once. Anytime we have a source for field, whether it's a source mass for a gravitational field or source charge for electrostatic field, like the simple case that we know is if that source is just one point, like one electron. Of course, reality entails many more cases than that in the cases that we're interested in. We are concerned with situations that consist of more than one point. Whenever we have more than one point of source material, of charge or of mass, if you have more than one point, each point must be accounted for equally. That's a burden, but it's also a, a liberating thing because as long as we account for each point equally, we so often can account for a whole. In other words, whatever our source is, consists of more than a point, we must account for the whole collection of points um, I'm saying to deal with the the, the fundamental question in electrodynamics is, given a source of charge over here, what is the electrostatic field over there? And in reality, um, any source of charge you ever have is going to be more than one point. It's going to be more than one electron. And it can be collected and assembled in any kind of shape or any kind of way. In real reality, reality, from the macroscopic perspective we're looking, these collections of charges are usually so tightly formed from our perspective that they might as well be continuous, right? Like it's like a infinitely divisible stream of charge. That's what we want to account for in reality. We have some stream of charge, some grouping, some continuous distribution of charge over here. We want to calculate the field function for any arbitrary spot over there. The way we do it is we deploy um, the principles of superposition and symmetry. A, we believe that as long as we can that we believe that each little charge piece there produces an inverse R squared force, which is not affected by the presence of any other charge over here. So we add up all the forces from all of them and just assume that we can do that equally, that you can pull or push another charge, but you can't pull or push another pull. That's what we're assuming. And then we also take advantage of symmetry. We say, well, if the forces are all going out the same way in these axes, 
then, I mean, if the charges are all shaped the same way in these axes, then the forces will be the same way in those axes, et cetera. Because we use those two principles, we, Okay, what we're going to turn to shortly is how to do the more complicated things, how to get fields from not just a point, but from a bunch of points, like in a line, or like in a sphere, or in a sheet, or something like that, or then things more complex than that. Um, um, before, yeah, before we go deeply into that, I want to make sure this connects to what you're doing in lab. So right now what I'm saying is for every point of charge that exists in the world, it is generating a field. The field can be understood or looked at um, by means of field lines. Um, um, and the ultimate action in the world is what kind of field line diagrams, field line situations result in uh, from pictures of, 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 of source charges that are um, more intricate than just a point. Um, pause for one second. So, um, I want to Okay, first of all, what does all this electrical field stuff have to do with electricity or electrical current, which is what you were going to study in the lab? Okay, um, um, field is force per charge. If, oops, sorry. Okay, 
I'm saying for the last time, at the risk of being repetitive, that if the fundamental question of electrodynamics is given some source distribution, some continuous distribution of charge, of source charge here, what is the electrostatic field function there? And that really means function, right? It means if you're given some shape of charge over here, if I name the R displacement vector from there, can you tell me the E vector that would sit at that spot and whose magnitude and direction would indicate the number of newtons I, that every Coulomb with positive chest charge sitting right there would feel, right? If that's the fundamental question of electrodynamics, given some source distribution over here of charge, what's the field over there? The reason that that is the fundamental question of electrodynamics is because it brings us back, whenever we answer that, that brings us back to the center of physics, the original mechanical piece that we never abandoned, which is, oh, once we know the field here, if you put any charge, once you know the field right here, due to some source over there, then you put or you find some realistic receiving test charge here. And if you know the field and you know that charge, you immediately know the net electrostatic force on the acting on the charge. So it all goes back to F equals MA. Like that is, we're always trying to predict the acceleration or the motion of something. Where's it gonna be when? So our new step is saying the way you get F is from E, the field. We want E. Because, always, because F equals Q E and F equals M A. Okay, so one example of this, I mean, to skip a hundred years in history and no details, example, voltaic cell, right? You get a bunch of positives over here, extra positives. And you get a bunch of extra negatives over here. How do you really do that? You really put a bunch of extra negatives over here and you remove a bunch of equal number of electrons over there, right? Because you can always move electrons around. That's why we call it electricity. You can't really move the protons around. But so here, you put a bunch of extra electrons. There, you have a deficiency of electrons. And you make a chemical like um, a reaction. Like you fill these two places with chemicals that are constantly plopping on extra electrons here when you need them and extra pro protons there. And all these guys now fear, feel a field. There's field lines going from these positives to these negatives. Now, what do field lines indicate? They indicate lines of force, lines where if you were to put anything on any one of these fields, it would accelerate any charge. It would accelerate in the direction tangential to the field line at that point. They're not lines of motion, right? But they're lines of instantaneous acceleration. Um, now, nothing's going to happen at all if there's no conducting material between these two, just these two um, uh, sources of charge. Like, this is like having a high cliff above a low valley. Like, there's a huge field here. There's a huge force waiting to happen. But until there is something that's allowed to experience that force, nothing's going to accelerate. Well, if we put conducting material, if we put conducting material, not in directly in between these two, but like that. So uh, material that allows for the free flow of electrons. And there's no sort of analogous thing exactly with mass, like mass can flow through a vacuum and it can't flow through other mass. Um, we'll get to why this is, but electrons cannot really, like, you know, every bit of matter has electrons in it, but electrons are, are free to move about the cabin more or less in more, in some materials more than they are in others. And metals tend to be more conductive, allowing for electrons that are free, that are not associated with any given nucleus or any given orbital shell or something like that. So if you put a path between a source charge of positives and a source charge of negatives, and you allow electrons, well, now you've got charges, say you've got electrons here who are in a field and are gonna be accelerated by that field in the direction of the field lines. Um, and all the positives will point, I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but um, this is 
will allow charges to start to flow and allow for what we call electrical current. Now, how exactly they flow, I want to get into in a few minutes. But but the first thing I want to say is like, what's the relationship between charge field? Like, is there a formula for current? What is it? Well, yes. What current is? Okay, it's usually we did it with an I. I don't know. Capital I means electrical. I don't know why. And what it is, what current actually is, is a little bit of one dimensional charge density, right? What it is, is a little bit of dq dx, right? Remember, like, like you might think of lambda as or, or. Remember we talked about density with the gravitational shells and stuff. And we talked about like sigma for two dimensional density, like amount of stuff for area and rho was amount of stuff for volume. Well, you could talk about amount of stuff per unit length, like one dimensional density. And you can talk about it with regard to mass, like mass density or other things that we have in the universe like charge. So I'm gonna, from now on, I'm gonna say a, a, a bit of charge density, a one dimensional, charge uh, coulomb per unit length, like this would be measured in coulombs per meter. Um, I'm going to uh, call lambda, a different lambda from the other one, sorry. Coulomb, and that's just the way it is in physics. If you measure in coulombs per meter, if I imagine like uh, uh, some amount, uh, and the amount in principle could change from any little spot, any spot, so that's why it's a derivative. But you know, if the amount happens to be a constant, then it'd be, then you can imagine like, oh, if I have one coulomb of charge per every one meter of unidirectional length, right? I can imagine like a line of charge. Now that itself is not current, right? A line of charge would be just that, like a line of extra protons or a line of electron holes. If you like. That was not current. But a line of velocity Right charge, I keep doing this. It's like a line of charge that's in motion. So current is not just a line of charge, but also current is not just a moving electron or something. Like a electron or a proton could have a velocity, dx dt. And that would just be a velocity. It'd be like throwing a baseball. How fast is that baseball going? Oh, dx dt. We're saying what current is that you're going to start looking at in the lab and what's in the real life manifestation of e-fields current is a line of charge with motion so it's a d it's a dq dx like infinitesimal like current defined down to its is a dq dx in other words a coulombs per meter times a dx dt a velocity some kind of number of meters of advancement uh, per unit time so a c over m times an m over s well indeed there's a cancellation that that you have to prove in math is okay because these things are infinitesimals, but like these are ratios of infinitesimals. If I take derivatives seriously as ratios of differentials, then what current then is I'm saying I'm saying current is a flow, electrical current the is the flow, is, is charges in motion. Like in principle, you could think like positive flow would be a bunch of protons in motion. Now that doesn't really happen. What really it is, if you say that this is positive current, what you really mean in a way is a bunch of electrons, a line of electrons are going the other way. But what I'm trying to say right now, before we, like before you get too, we get too antsy about whether it's that way or that way, like, yes, it's, oops, sorry, it's more realistic, just lost something, but it's more realistic if you're going to picture electrical current to picture it as a bunch of electrons than a bunch of protons. But then it can also be confusing to do that because it gets into negative and positive signs issue, issues. So before we get too hyped about, sorry, I'm losing my pad, about like the precise reality of these metaphors, I also want you to see that 
a electron moving by itself does not constitute a current. A current very specifically is a flow, just like a bunch of oscillators is not itself a wave. A wave is a flow through oscillators. Um, to say, I'm totally losing my connection here. Give me a second. Pardon me. I see what's happening. Pardon me if my internet connection is. Or at least for my board. Okay, hopefully. Right. Maybe I have a board here. Um, electrical current is electrical flow. That is one ampere of current. One coulomb. So to say that there's one ampere of current in it, in it somewhere in a wire is to say that if you, it, it, it's something that refers to somewhere in a wire or somewhere in a something, like maybe somewhere in a lightning bolt. But if you talk about current, you're talking about an instantaneous quantity, it's a derivative. It, it, the idea of current is that you pick a particular location, like X equals blah, and you stand there in your mind, somewhere in the wire or somewhere wherever. And it's a, a point along this line um, defined by the wire, and you're at standing at that point at with um, a stopwatch or whatever, and you let your stopwatch go for a full second, and you count how many coulombs fly by you at that point per second, and then you you take it to the limit, divide by a second to take it all the way to. But to calculate electrical flow is to calculate how much stuff is going by per unit time given a certain location. So different from speed, right? Speed is how much distance something, some defined object covers in a certain amount of time. There's no defined object here. We're not tracking one piece of charge. We're tracking one, we're standing at a location and asking how many different charges go by per unit time. So that's why I call it a flow, right? And that's why this is a kind of unthingy motion here. In fact, the idea is, The idea is that no matter where you measure dq dt, within a given, within a fixed um, um, path, okay, within a fixed path, i.e., within some play path, some unambiguous route. Uh, Meaning whether you have a given line, like from, uh, 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 from this positive cell, th this positive, this anode in a cell to this cathode in a voltaic cell, or whether you have a closed line, like a loop, like around and around this. Once you pick a particular path and you ask, what's the current through this path? To even believe that there's current at all, to even assume that there's some flow that's been established, the idea is for, in, unless you're doing something odd or on purpose, 
in a given path, there is one current that you would measure, whether you measure it over here or over there within that path. Because the idea is this is a flow that represents, that, ha, that is somewhat steady. Like the idea of flow, we already assumes a steadiness of flow. Otherwise we wouldn't call it a flow. It would just be like a random occurrence. Flow assumes some level of steadiness of flow. You even have heard the term steady state circuits as opposed to not. Flow assumes steadiness. And, and a lot of things might be unsteady, but if you're calling it a flow at all, to, call, to think of it as a steady flow would mean any two points, any two points within one path, like one medium, like, like yeah, any two points within one path, like one wire from here to there or one wire back to itself, but not one wire from here to this rock and then another wire that starts at the rock and then goes to a toaster. Like, you know, one path from one place to another, any, any two points within one path, um, the current should be one constant value because, because it's the value that things come to once they're given enough time to come to that value, which in other words, if you go to a supermarket, sometimes you go to a supermarket and there's no flow at the registers. Like someone could just, they could be just opening up the supermarket or something like, a, you know, a virus just hit the supermarket. So they're in the middle of shutting down or some, you could walk in in an unstable moment in the supermarket. And then like the cashier situation is anybody's guess. Like maybe over here, if you happen to be lucky, you get through the line in no time, but over there, the line is all jammed. Like, but if things, if it's like normal day in New York City and systems are in place and going and you walk in at an arbitrary moment to a supermarket, if there's any, even if it's super crowded and super annoying and you have to wait online for a super long time, like Whole Foods, a Columbus Circle or something, they still have a flow going there if they're a corporation that's doing the right thing. Like they'll still have a flow where the line can be very long, but all the lines have now, and it's some system where all the cashier lines are all equal, all their although they're all long. And the flow is that you can actually get online and they can tell you, you'll be out of here in 25 minutes, sir. And they can sort of be right, except in calling you sir, because that might well be offensive. Um, but because they've, because they've reached a steady state flow where, where all the lines are equal because that maximizes flow, because the minute like a cashier is noticed to be, you, you know what I'm saying, because the minute like a new line opens up for a second. It's the exciting new fast line with no one in it. But of course, the minute everybody notices it, they're all going to go to that line because it's exciting until all of a sudden it's not the fast line anymore. Right, right. So current is the idea that electrons are flowing um, through a line or around a loop. Um, and any two points within that loop, whatever the current is, it's like an average value of flow that more or less has been reached all over the place. Should I say one more thing about this? Now, this is because of the field, right? These are real charges. If we say current is flowing, we do mean that there is actual electrical charges in motion, yes. But just like saying sound doesn't mean, just like saying sound assumes the air molecules are in motion, still to say that I shout to you does not mean that I send any one particular air molecule to your ears from my mouth, right? Similarly here, from here on in, when we talk about the flow around a wire, if we talk about the flow from a cathode to an anode or from a battery to a resistor, what we mean is the flow, the number of charge, net charge that move per second. There might not at all be any individual electron that ever goes from an anode to a cathode or goes from a battery to a resistor. This is the sense in which it's flow. We're not counting individual items. Likely no individual item ever makes any trip that we're ever gonna talk about here. What makes a trip is net flow. So so to think of electrical current, if you want to picture current, don't picture, like people will say it's wrong to picture a proton going around a whole wire because protons don't move. That's true, it is wrong. But it's also very wrong and misleading to picture an electron going backwards around the wire because no electron is doing that. You might want to picture a whole bunch of electrons going around the wire, but what you really should picture, if that's even better, if you want to picture electrical current, is picture a compression wave of electrons throughout the wire. 
picture an electron here rippling a little bit, and then over here rippling a little bit, and then here. So that what we're sending is pressure pockets of charge, charge dense. We're, pick, we're send, excuse me, we're not sending bits of charge along with velocity, we're sending charge densities along with velocity, just like the, in the concentration of charge per unit space, we're flowing along by having two electrons knock toward each other and then knock away, and then two, okay? So it's like sound in the sense, picture, when, if you wish to picture electrical current, it's best, it's best to get this, I don't know what that thing is. Um, Okay, now this is a metaphor. I mean, it's like, it's not exactly sound in there, but even the sound in the air thing is a metaphor. Everything at some level is just us trying to picture these amazing phenomena, okay? The one thing I'm trying to say right now is to picture electrical current, picture a flow, like a compression wave, like picture a prop. In other words, current, in other words, current is not a, a um, trajectory. It's a propagation. If you want to understand it all, it's best to understand it that way. Eh, well. Okay, current motion is not particle motion. It's not good. It's better to understand it as a propagation, a ripple of charge, rather than as like a charge with, or a bunch of charges with particular trajectories. In the same way as we have with waves and medium, and similarly, like just like a wave needs a medium, like electrical current needs a conducting path. Um, um, and just like with waves, we picture there to be, so let me put it this way. Oh yeah, there's like similarities. Like, just like with sound or some wave, once we fix the medium, um, then we, in effect, fix the speed of propagation of that sound. Same thing here. Once you allow the electrical current to go through, once you fix the conducting material, like for that bit of material, you're fixing one speed at which this ripple propagates, because it is a ripple. It's not like any individual charge. So wherever you measure, you're measuring an average to begin with, and the average is determined by the material through which this ripple is occurring. Okay, so. It, so electrical current functions a lot like a sound wave. You know, tech, I'm not saying that technically it is. Well, I'm not saying we're going to apply the electrical. I'm not saying we're going to apply the wave equation to it. Also, everything I'm talking about here is current, not field lines. Current is caused by field lines. So I should say like, uh, well, um, yeah, I don't even want to, conf yeah, so, so, Sticking with current for a second, then, then, then current is flow of electrical charge. Now, how does field fit into this field? So if, so if you differentiate charge, you get current. If you integrate field, you get voltage. It's, it's so unbelievably simple. It's uh, staggering, but it's simple. It's not easy at all. So I'll say this. This is what current is, a volt or potential difference is this is a bit more of a mouthful but it's 
So, by this B right here, I mean voltage, which is not a great word, but just the word that most people know. And this is a delta, like difference between or change. And I'm going to be, I'm going to define a second, but like I'm trying to relate what we're saying about charges and fields. I'm trying to relate electrostatics to what you do in the lab or what we do in real life, electrodynamics. Like once we get the charges in motion, we have these circuits. I'm trying to relate to that. Well, the relationships are current is how much charge flows by in a second. Voltage is the integral of the electric field. This is now this get it's simple, but it is not easy. It gets abstract fast. And once we develop all this, well, in this lecture for today, I think. But what I'm saying is, All right, I do this differently every semester because this is a little bit tricky, but I guess I'm saying this. Now, let me try to read, this is, this is a mouthful. Let me try to read it, what I'm saying in English, and then I'll try to break it down. And again, if we can get through this concept in this lecture, that's certainly good enough for this lecture. I mean, I still wanna go back to uh, another piece of fields. But, but um, what this is saying is, voltage is a concept or a measurement that applies to two different spots. Voltage is um, a relationship, just like velocity is a relation, just like force is a relation. Like, oh, this always happens in physics. Force is an interaction between two objects, right? Velocity is a comparison between two objects. Field is something that one object has, or perhaps um, a mass is something that one object has, right? So there's different quantities in physics. Current is something that you measure at one spot, like current applies to a place a position, but you measure it at, at that one place. And you get a derivative. Um, so that concept applies even in the limit as that place becomes a smaller and smaller place. Voltage is not that way. Voltage, I'm losing my board again. Um, my stuff, if I can't get it back. Voltage is not an instantaneous quantity or derivative quantity. It's not about one infinitesimal spot. It's actually a something that exists or applies or is measurable between two spots. Voltage applies to the interval between two spots. Again, just like you can have position or you can have displacement, right? The displacement is the difference between two positions. Um, similarly here, voltage is something that has no meaning until you apply it to space and you apply it to the comparison between two points in space. Now I want to see what about this, if I can get my board back. I know what's happening. Okay, should have this right there. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, I'm saying, um, okay, so.
Okay, just a sec. So you have to picture two places, and by that I really mean points in space, but I didn't have the space to write that. So I, but I'm emphasizing, first of all, if this is a function, the independent variable is like R, is like as a displacement in space. So voltage, so with current, you pick a point in space somewhere and you measure the current there. With voltage, you pick two points in space, and now you're gonna measure something about the interval be between those two points. Um, I'm gonna write it again. Now, I have to say what that interval is and all that, but first of all, I wanna discuss the two points. Um, <coughs> the two points I could call, I could call like R1 and R, okay, so you're measuring between two points. This thing, this thing here is driving me crazy. I'm sure there's a way, anyway. Okay. Like, what do I mean by V plus and V minus? Well, I mean to direct our attention to what I could call, well, I mean, well, they refer to R plus and R minus, of course. But what do I mean by that? Like, R plus and R minus are two arbitrary locations in space. Like, two spaces, two points in space where you could be measuring the field of something, two arbitrary locations in space. So I could call them R2 and R1 or something like that. But what I know in advance is that one is at higher voltage than the other. Of course, I have to define what I mean by voltage to say that, but you pick just like with any two masses that you're gonna measure the gravity. You, if they're arbitrary, then one has a greater mass than the other. Same thing here, I'm gonna pick two points and see what the difference in V is between those two points. Well, one of them will have, let's assume, has a higher positive V than the other then I'm going to call that one positive. Like in other words, in other words, R plus could have been called simply R2 or better yet, or it could have been called R high um, or R V equals high or something, but whatever we called it, we're assuming that R is the place where we would get a higher voltage than the other place. In other words, I'm just setting up an equation, a definition in advance just to say, however we're gonna find our answers, let's set this up so that when we integrate in a certain direction, we get a positive answer and no unnecessary negatives, right? So this is gonna be, we're gonna measure a difference it's like saying, I'm gonna define how to measure height difference between two people. Well, the way you measure height difference between two people is you say, take the higher, the taller one, take his or her height, and then subtract from that the height of the shorter one. That's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna like subtract some value from some other value, and we're just setting it up so that's positive. But what are these two values? What are we doing to I'm saying if we're going to measure the voltage between two places in space, like two places in a wire, what we're going to find, what we're going to be measuring is the comparison stable it is to be at one of those places compared to the other. How much more badly you'd want to be at the other than the one if you were some inanimate object. So it's going to be like comparing like the height of a bookshelf to the height of a floor, like how unstable is the top of a bookshelf compared to a floor. Um, 
as opposed to how unstable is like like the bottom of the top of a little garbage can compared to a floor or something. Okay, we're, we're going to be measuring instability specifically. So, so to measure voltage between two locations is to measure electrical instability, how much more, uh, how unstable one location is in comparison to the other. But specifically, Specifically to say, to, to say, to measure the potential between, sorry, to measure the voltage between two locations is to integrate the field between those two locations. I'm going to break that down more in a second. But to do that is to measure what we call the electrostatic potential between those two locations. It's very much like the idea of potential energy, but it is not the same. When we measure voltage, between two locations, if we say there's, this is high voltage, this is nine volts, ultimately what we're saying is this location is nine volts more electrically potential than that location. There's more, nine volts more electric potential than here, like potential for charges to flow if given the opportunity from here to here. And what does nine mean? What would that mean? Well, I'll break it down further in a second too, but what it first off means is it more than five and less than 15 or something. Like it's all relative, but I will be more specific in a second, but to what we're measuring, when we measure voltage between two locations is we're measuring electrostatic potential. We're, we're, we're integrating the field to get electrostatic, electrostatic, electrostatic potential. What is that? Like, what is that? How does it relate to IE? Electrostatic potential is built, is a concept built from electrostatic potential energy. Totally related, totally related in an important way, i.e. good thing. If I, say electric, if I say electrostatic potential and your brain goes to electrostatic potential energy, that's a good association. That's where it should go. But now let me make clear, it should go there in order to complete the association and see how the two are functioning differently. Electrostatic potential literally means potential energy per charge, um, i.e. one volt of electrostatic potential is defined to be one joule of electrostatic potential energy per charge, per one coulomb of electrostatic charge, right? A volt is what we call, a volt is a joule per coulomb. Voltage is, so volts are the units that, so, I'm sorry. One volt is the unit, the standard SI, MKS unit of, like, of electrostatic potential. Okay, there's, there's not really actually a real world voltage. Like, to, well, hello. I will lose the back line. Okay, I'll be right back. Um, when we measure, when anybody says this battery has nine volts, what they're saying is that between the positive terminal of the battery and the negative terminal of the battery, 
which are usually sticking out of a battery. Like if it's a double A battery, that'd be like the top and bottom ends. If it's a nine volt battery, which I guess is what I said in the example, then it's those two little sticking up things on the top. But if they say this whole battery is a nine volt battery, what they really are saying is between these two known and defined configured locations in the battery, there is nine volts of electrostatic potential. Volts are the units that we use to measure electrostatic potential, just like we use amperes to measure current or use feet to measure length, right? Okay, the thing that we're measuring here is electrostatic potential, which I still have to break down, but, the th but it is ultimately the integral of the field. But electrostatic potential is measured in volts, so then people talk about it vo as voltage, which is fine. I mean, that's like in football talking about yardage, like yardage is like a fun, hip, athletic way to talk about distance. We can talk about voltage as long as we always understand though, that there's, it, there's no meaning actually to a battery having voltage. What there is meaning, like you can't measure the voltage of a circuit, you can't measure the voltage of an item, you measure the voltage between two points in a particular space. And when you measure that, what you're measuring is how much electrical potential energy each one coulomb of charge has at the high place as compared to the low. Okay, so the two places, we could just call high and low, but we call positive and negative because we can just always reset our zero. We're saying, um, um, right, um, the electrostatic potential, sorry, the electrostatic potential difference between two locations, like one location where there's a whole bunch of protons and another location where there's fewer net protons or maybe a bunch of net electrons or something, but two locations that have different source charge configurations or are near different, there are different distances from particular source charge configurations, right? So two places that are different places in the field, to measure the electrostatic potential difference between the locations is to measure is to measure how much electrostatic potential energy each would be possessed by in joules, like how much potential energy in joules would be possessed We're asking the question, how much electrostatic potential energy in joules would each one coulomb, one hypothetical test amount of one positive coulomb, would each positive one coulomb of net charge experience if it were at R plus? due to R minus, right? So we're saying, if we ask what's the potential difference between this place and this place, we're asking if I put one coulomb of positive net charge at this top place, how much potential energy, electric potential energy would it have due to all the negative charge down here? If there were one positive coulomb of charge up here, how much electric potential energy would it have due to all that negative stuff down there? If I ask that of every one, every hypothetical or hypothesized positive one coulomb of net charge that might be supposed to be at this location, for each one of those coulombs of charge, the number of joules I'm getting in return as answer to that question is what we mean by electric potential, is what we mean by volts. Like, and by the way, why would there be electric potential energy over here at these pluses due to these minuses? Because there's field lines running from the pluses to the minuses and it takes work to move any positive charge against the field lines, right? It's all just like gravity. This, so now we're gonna tie it back to the fields. It's soon be done. Like recall, like let's, let's recall the roots of potential energy, if you don't mind. Recall the roots of the concept of potential energy. Let's 
like, where did the concept of potential energy come from in the first place? So it comes from that energy is the ability to do work, right? Energy is the capacity to interact with another object and thereby change something about it, such as its position, right? Energy is the ability to interact. Energy is the ability of one object to interact with another object and thereby cause a change in its configuration, such as where it is or how fast it's going or something, right? That's what energy is. Similarly, to do work is to transfer energy, right? If I do positive work on you, if I interact, if I exert a force on you and displace you, if I do work on you, I've, I now set you in motion, let's say I transferred kinetic energy to you. But potential energy never came up until we had conservative forces, right? Friction does not store energy for anybody, nor does it give in, any energy back to anybody ever. There's a transfer of kinetic energy whenever work is done by one object to another. The issue of potential energy comes up whenever we have conservative forces. Whenever we have forces that do a net amount of zero work over a closed path. Okay. I'm going to have to write this again because it's this important and I'm clearly making a mess of it right here. Well, I'm going to read it first. I'm going to write it again on the next page. I'm trying to say, let's remember what potential energy is in the first place. That means you have to remember what energy is in the first place. And I don't want to write like everything all over again from physics one, but if energy is the ability to do work and if work is the transfer of energy, which is true, right? And it almost sounds like a circle because it is, but work is the activity of transferring energy and energy is that commodity that you must possess in order to transfer it. And so on and so forth. So, so it's like money and transactions, right? So if energy is the capacity and work is the transaction, then potential energy was the ability to do work due to specifically something. Like, let me back up. Kinetic energy was the ability to do work by virtue of motion. Like I have the ability to exert a force on you and thereby move you the simplest way to see why I might have that ability is if I myself am in, am in motion already. If I'm a mass that's careening toward you, like I'm a hockey puck on ice and I've got velocity and I'm careening toward you. Well, we all kind of, I think, say and believe and I think correctly that, oh yeah, like all I have to do is whack into you and then I'll exert a force on you and you'll be moving soon and you'll be moving faster than you were before and you'll be in a different place from where you were. So if I'm moving, I clearly have the ability to transfer that moving energy to you and get you moving. And in the process, like I'll lose some and I'll slow down or back up or whatever, whatever. That's kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the ability to do work by virtue of motion. Potential energy is the ability to do work by virtue of something else, by virtue of configuration, right? We don't always have, like potential energy is when you seem to have the energy to do something, to do work, but not because you're already going so fast, but because the way you're configured, your system, or the, where you are, seems to mean that any moment we can count on you moving and then getting kinetic energy, right? What, like, right, like there's not always potential energy in all examples. In a, Like where does potential energy comes from, come from in the first place? Why do we believe in it? We believe it comes from the way a system is configured. What we're really saying though, since work, you still can't get energy without doing work and you can't do work without transferring energy. Potential energy comes from in the first place the work
some work done against There is potential energy, we believe, or we say that energy is stored whenever we see a situation that where we can picture an equilibrium and we picture that the situation is not in equilibrium, right? Like if an object is not on the floor, if it's higher than H equals zero, we believe that it has NGH, this potential energy, because we know that there's a conservative force there called gravity that we know we had to fight against to get this book um, above the floor. We know we had to do work, exert a force through displacement to get the book above the floor, since we know gravity always points down. And we know that if we stop doing it, like once we stop doing that work, um, uh, that all we have to do is let the book go back to the floor and it, its motion, it will accumulate back the exact same number of joules as we had to put into it to get it there in the first place. If we, if we know in advance that we're dealing with a conservative force like gravity or a spring force or an electrostatic force, if we know there's some equilibrium state or we know some states are more close to equilibrium than others, like protons want to be near electrons, masses want to be near other masses, the spring wants to be condensed, not stretched. Or, right? um, whenever something's in disequilibrium and we've done work against the, um, we've done work against some conservative force, then we know, then we say potential energy has been accumulated. Well, just like we abstracted from force to field, we can abstract from potential energy to potential and say, like, like, okay. In general, in physics across the board, in mechanics, right? Pick any two places. I'm going to call them R equals A and R equals B. Like I could say X equals A and X equals B, but I'm going to use R now. Any two points along some axis, point A and point B, if you exert a force um, from, if you, if a force is exerted on some object from one location to the other, so that if there's a force and there's a displacement on the same object, the dot product of the force and displacement throughout that interval is what we call work, right? The work done on an object from A to B is the integral of the dot product of the, of the force vector and the displacement vector. It's a dot product because we only multiply the like components, right? And then what we get out is a scalar. In other words, like what we get is something that's measured in joules is what we get when we dot something in newtons with something in meters like the newtons have a certain direction the meters have a certain direction that we dot it and we get joules we get some kind of work done in joules or change in energy that doesn't have a direction anymore right that's what work is um when oops sorry Sorry. Actually, let me write this in. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to do that. 
this is just complicating things. I'm saying a lot of changing it, sorry. I'm saying I'm saying when you calculate work, right, what you're really doing is doing an integral of a dot product. It's a dot product because you're taking two vectors and you're looking at just how the, the, you're measuring the extent to which those two vectors are parallel to each other. And it's an integral because you're taking into account in general, when you do the work from any one spot to another, you're taking into account the possibility that the force function might change continuously as you move from one spot to the other. So work done by any one object on any other object, um, in other words, the energy transferred from any one object to any other object is always an integral of a dot product. Technically, that's called a path integral. I mean, if it's in one dimension, it's called a path integral. Now, I'm saying let's introduce a new piece of notation now, actually. Let's introduce a closed integral. I'm introducing it. It's a thing. It's real. I'm not making it up. But I'm not assuming you've seen it in a math class, but it's a nice... What you've seen in a math class, and maybe you have, which is fine, too. In math class, up until now, we've had definite integrals or indefinite integrals. Right, definite means from a particular boundary to, to another particular boundary, so that when you get an answer to the integral, you get a definite answer without a plus c. And indefinite means it's just the function itself generally integrated. I'm going to say from now on, if you see a circle on an integral sign, that means it's a certain kind of definite integral. I keep doing this. meaning the space with respect to which I'm integrating, the space over which I'm integrating, the path is defined. It's not just like, in general, what would happen if I integrated along some path? Like from a, No, I'm specifying a particular path. So this integral, if I could solve it, will spit out a specific answer. But if I put a circle, what that means is imagine that it's a closed path, that it's one dimensional, but that wherever you start on, that the boundaries of integration are rather than A and B, they're like A and A that you start wherever you want, and then you walk around this path integrating as you like multiplying as you go, throwing it in, let me start again. If any integral, like f dot dx, you take a little step dx, you ask what's the value of f, you multiply these two things together, you put them in your bag, and then you take another step dx, ask what's f there, multiply together, put them in your bag, and you take it, right? And you take all this infinite number of infinitesimal steps and the total sum of what you arrive at, the sum of all these individual products, is supposed to be the value of your integral at the end. I mean, it is. That is what an integral is. I'm saying now imagine doing that process, but the path that you're walking, each time you take an infinitesimal one-dimensional step along R and you ask, what's the force doing here? Let's imagine that the path you took, wherever you started, takes you back to yourself eventually because let's imagine it's a closed path. It's a loop, right? If that, that such a process is possible to do mathematically. And when we do it, we call it a closed integral. Right now we're in one dimension, so I'm calling it a closed path integral. It's still definite, definite integral, but it's closed. But like the two boundaries, so to speak, equal each other. Now, sometimes you can do those integrals and sometimes you can't. But for any force that we ever find ourselves integrating over a closed path, If we find a force, so, so again, I'm saying, how do you calculate the work done by some force? You integrate the dot product of that force with some path, some path. And work is something that can only be calculated along a path, right? I mean, you can't calculate the work done at a point. You can calculate how much work is accumulated and done throughout some interval between two points. Like you accumulate joules as you exert a force through a displacement. If you're just exerting a force at a spot, then that's just a force. That's not joules, that's just Newtons, right? So I'm saying now imagine that the path that, you, that you'd measure force along, imagine for some path you have, that whenever you measure, 
it, along a closed path, the total integral you get is zero. That does happen sometimes. Whenever that does happen, we call any path for which that's true. Oh, I'm sorry, any force for which that's true, any force for which it is the case that the closed path integral over a round trip under the presence of that force, if you always get zero, then we call that force a conservative force. That's what gravity is, that's what the, um, a sp elasticity is, that's what the electrostatic coulomb force is. That is not what all forces are. Friction is not, normal force is not, tension is not, so just to, Um, let me see. This is a force which does a net work of zero around any round trip is a conservative force. I mean, the easiest example to see. So, so. So, I guess. Okay, spring is kind of an odd one. It doesn't even seem like it should be in the left group, but it totally is, and it's one of the reasons we spend so much time on it. But, but the main thing is that most contact forces are not conservative. Friction is not conservative. In that, if I push like this cup across the table, yeah, across the table, right? So I push the cup to the left, and I want to know how much work is done by friction on this. Like, like so I push the cup to the left, and friction is while I, if I'm on the table, it's hard to. So while I push the cup to the left friction from the table is pushing to the right, right? Okay. So I push the cup for like three meters to the left. I could say that I can define left to be positive. So I can define whatever I want to be positive. Let's say to the left is positive. So when the cup is displacing to the left, friction is pushing to the right. So friction is doing negative work on it. But if I then yank the cup back, so I complete a round trip with it. So I bring the cup back from now in the other direction. Well, now the displacement's going to be in the other direction and get a negative sign. But the force of friction is also going to be in the opposite direction and flip its sign as well. Like if I push the cup out to the west, friction is pushing to the east. When I bring the cup back to the east, friction is pushing to the west. So the total amount of work that friction does over a round trip is like double whatever it would do for half that trip. Like, duh, except that totally doesn't work that way with gravity. Gravity, while something's on the way up, gravity's pulling it down. So the work done by gravity on something on its way up is negative work, right? Like something flat, like if I throw something up while it's going up, gravity is pulling down while the thing displaces up. So gravity's doing negative work, i.e. slowing the thing down. Then the thing starts coming back down, gravity's now doing positive work because the displacement flips, whereas the force does not, right? In friction, Friction flips according to your direction. Gravity is just pulling down no matter what. So over a round trip up to down, whatever you lost to gravity, you get back on the way down, we say. We call that conservative and we say, therefore, any trip you make under gravity, we can just view, so, so on. The 
forces that do that, that do what gravity does, what springs do, that do what like some states are more stable than others. What we're always saying there is, yeah, the force is always pulling in a particular direction. And we know in advance, if you went a round trip under the influence of that direction, you would net nothing, right? That's true of all those forces, spring out, spring in, like would be positive work out, but the negative work in. So any trip that's ever made under the influence of one of those forces, we treat as just the way out of some round trip. And we make a prediction. We say that energy is being stored while you're sitting out there away from equilibrium, just because we're predicting how much you're going to get back on the way back in, because we know, because we know it's going to be the same as whatever happened out. In other words, conservative forces, the definition of a conservative force is one for which the closed path integral of such force with, like a conservative force is one that does zero work over a round trip. That's what a conservative force is. With conservative forces, we associate potential energy. We say, okay, so, so work, so remember work done by any force, the work done from like R equals A to R equals B, is the integral of whatever the force is from A to B, that's work. If, if the, cons the force that we're talking about happens to be conservative, then we can say the work, if we go, We could look at the work that a conservative force would do to bring something from some spot back to equilibrium. Realize that's the same, and we know that in advance. We know it's the same thing as the work that we had to do against the object to bring it away from equilibrium. We know it's the same thing with negative sign. Because if it's a conservative force, we know that the whole total has to equal zero. So we say, so whenever we're under the presence of a only conservative forces and something's in disequilibrium, we can just right away say, ah, the work that's going to be done to bring that object back to equilibrium is energy that we know the thing will accumulate, kinetic energy, if that, we ever let that happen. So we can say right now it's storing it as potential energy, i.e. what is potential energy? So potential energy doesn't apply when you're talking about non-conservative forces, but, but you can call it delta PE or you, let me make this neater. I'm saying the change in potential energy, which I'm going to call delta U. I am saying that the amount of potential energy you gain or the amount of potential energy some mass has at some height above the ground, at some age that is non-zero, what is the potential energy it has? And you could say it's MGH. Where did that come on this object to get it away from equilibrium? The amount of work we had to do against the conservative force of gravity, well, we had to exert a force MG and we had to do it for a distance H. So we did MGH work to get this object into a disequilibrium place of like not on the floor, the amount of work we had to do, the amount of, to get it there is exactly the same as the amount of work that gravity will do on it. If we let this thing go, gravity will point down mg. The thing will start falling down, down again, and it's fall down will be mgh, like, and I'll be converted to 1fmb squared and blah, 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 right? So we know the minute that all we're, all we're dealing with is conservative forces, then the integral of the conservative force from some higher, so from some unstable location down to ground, or in other words,
you could call it like this. I'm saying that the amount of potential energy that something would have at one location relative to another location or due to another location is entirely due to whatever work we would have to do against a conservative force to get the object to that first location. Right now, it has to be a conservative force for us even to talk about potential energy. But if there is a conservative force, then whatever we work, whatever work we do against the conservative force to get something into disequilibrium is a perfect prediction of how much energy will be gained whenever the thing falls back to equilibrium. So we can calculate that work either from R and call it from R equals R to R equals zero, or we can just say, assume two places, one that's at higher potential than the other, potential energy, one that is um, farther away from equilibrium than the other. Then if you know how much work the conservative force would do to bring an object from the high to the low, then that's what we mean in the gain of potential energy that I'm calling U here, okay? That's you, but uh, all the but these conservative forces are that we're concerned with here are forces that act at a distance and then translate themselves into fields. So we can so whatever potential energy an object accumulates due to the presence of a conservative force can just as easily be thought about as the potential that a location gains due to the presence of a conservative field. In other words, I'm saying this. I'm literally saying we've now turned one abstraction that we made earlier into like a two by two matrix of, of analogies. I'm saying just as we went from a force between two objects to a field generated by one of those objects, or put another way, just as we went from I push you force to I push on space field, now I'm saying, well, between two objects, as long as they're pushing in a conservative way, as long as the interaction between two objects is conservative, like the gravitational force or the spring force or the electrostatic force, as long as it's conservative, then we can talk about how much potential energy I have due to you. Because like I could be a rock on a cliff and you're planet Earth. So I can have a lot of potential energy due to how, how much work it would have to take to how much work you would do on me to let me bring me back to the appropriate spot. So just like forces interaction between two objects, and potential energy is a, a capacity that one object has due to another, then field is something generated by one object onto space, and potential is a, is a measurement of something at a point in space due to another object. Potential energy is between two objects. Potential is due to one object. Force is between two objects. Field is between two objects. In other words, I'll take it one step further. This is only true for point charges, what I'm saying here, but. And magnitude, magnitude. I'm not going to get bogged down in the signs and directions right now. It's not about vectors right now. I'm just saying that you could say this. And then you could say this. And then you could say this. And then you can say this. It really does. In fact, this is so important. I'm going to do it one more time on the next page, even neater. I'm really, I'm trying to finally say that electrostatic potential is to electrostatic potential energy as electrostatic field is to electrostatic static force, I am literally saying that, um, 
and electrostatic potential, what we actually mean by voltage, what we're measuring, what we measure, we're measuring the electrostatic potential between two locations. We're not measuring the field, we're not measuring the potential energy, we're measuring things similar, to, we're measuring the electrostatic potential, which is the integral of the field. When you measure the volt, if you say this is a nine volt battery, you're saying place and the minus place. And what you're really saying is if you integrated the field from plus to minus, you would get field was the work that you'd have to do against. If you want to know how much work you'd have to do against the field to bring every one coulomb of positive charge from the negative pole of the battery to the positive pole where it doesn't want to be, for every one coulomb of charge that you want to bring over from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal of the battery, if we're saying the battery is nine volts, we're saying for every one coulomb of charge you want to bring over from negative to positive, you'd have to do nine joules of work against that field line. That's what we're saying, okay? Right, one last, that's what voltage is, electrostatic potential. It's potential energy per charge. Again, one volt is one joule per coulomb. So again, I guess I'm saying, what I, I wanted to write it this way now. All right, I'll write one more other way. There's like, and then we'll stop. This is all, I know I haven't solved any problem. It's like Newtons, Newtons per coulomb. And this is like joules, and this is joules per coulomb. And when we go this way, we're dividing by an object. This is like per charge. When we go down the matrix, so to speak, or when we go down this way, we're in effect integrating by R because we're changing from force to work. Um, that's what voltage is. I, it's, that is the most abstract concept we have so far. I, like, I hate a wall with that. The first, like, many people do physics. Electrostatic potential is electrostatic potential energy per charge. Electrostatic potential energy per charge is how on one location is another or compared to another or due to another because of how much work would have to be done on, on any given charge to get it from the more stable location exists between those two locations. It's a lot. You have to think about it. Um, there's one other way I'm going to say, oh, but how, again, all to relate to circuits. So, and so far I'm saying, so far we have is I current is dQ dT. Okay, delta V voltage. Again, you're going to start doing like simulated circuits Monday and Tuesday. It's a bummer that, I mean, this is like the most fun thing in physics really when it's real. But reality will come back someday, we hope that. And whenever you're doing circuits, it's all about voltage, current, and resistance. Current is this, voltage is this. And some people use R, some people use X, some people use L, we'll talk about that. And then what's resistance? What is resistance? Oh, sorry, and lastly, we're gonna stop in a moment. Oh, yeah. Or you could also well, we know that. Um, so say, oh, this is right, this is voltage. What's resistance? And we're gonna end on this literally, not on that, on this. What is resistance? Thank goodness. Resistance is the easiest thing to say about resistance is it's the constant of proportionality that we blessedly find when we set up situations 
with voltaic cells and wires, when we set up situations of variable voltage and we ask how's the current responding to a given voltage, like voltage ultimately is potential difference. It's the reason, voltage is the reason charge would want to flow or need to flow from one spot to another. Then current is the flow itself. If we out different voltages for a given setup and see control regions in small enough quantities, there's a linear relationship between it. Like you pop, you'll get twice the current, but there's a constant of proportionality. In other words, think of current as the dependent variable and voltage as the independent variable. Luckily, there's a constant slope between these two things. And that slope, like the more current you get per unit of voltage, that slope is the is called conductance, uh, and it's very hard to make control as much as its inverse, which we then call resistance. In other words, one ohm is the last. So I'm saying resistance is the inverse of something called conductance, and conductance is just exactly is the constant of proportionality for how much amperes of current you get out for each voltage of potential you put in. In other words, one, one mo one unit of one unit of conductance conductance by definition equals one ampere of current that you get out for every one volt of potential difference that you put in um, right that's a unit of conductance but it turns out to be much harder to manipulate, measure, control, and manufacture according to, like units of conductance are teeny, teeny, teeny units. So we flip instead and we look at one unit of resistance, we just flip it. A unit of electrical resistance is the reverse, like how much voltage you have to put in for any unit of electrical current that you get out. So one unit of resistance equals one volt per one ampere and that we call an ohm of resistance. So finally, so one ohm of resistance is equal to one volt of, of electro potential difference per every one ampere of electrical current um, that you get. Uh, so, so what R is by definition is just, it, 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 R is the relationship between delta V and I. What's lovely is it turns out that it basically turns out to be a number, not a complicated relationship. We basically think that if you graphed I as a function of V, you get a straight line. And the inverse of the slope of that line is what we call resistance measured in ohms. So what, a unit of resistance is a unit of electrical potential energy per unit of current, one ohm, one ohm of resistance is one volt of electrical potential difference, which is the hardest concept per one ampere current. I'm gonna stop there. This is a lot. I think that was very long, two hours. Okay, so more later.